Ta-da! Right? Five, four, three, no. uh, I just can't, I can't help but just stop for a second. And do you know what that picture is? Those are our kids. And uh, Peter was just sharing with me while, it's, uh, while that video was put together. What a beautiful picture of our kids in Maru and our kids here in UP and Tacoma. But, uh, but that we've had this incredible transformation uh, in Maru because of the partnership in our church. But I would say that Maru's had an incredible transformation on our church, right, Colleen? And I can't say it enough. You cannot be part of this church, UPBC, very long without understanding the heartbeat of this church for children, not just our, our own in our community, but where God has led us around the world. And to have joint worship like that. So, you know, in a perfect setting, we'd all be in one room, we could worship together. But this side of heaven, we can't do that. But we can look forward to the day when Jesus will bring us all together. And the kind of transformation that's happening in that ministry is so powerful. So once again, I just invite you to uh, be a part of the celebration today at 4.30 if you have time. No, uh, no Seahawks game. So that kind of worked out nicely, didn't it? Yeah. Hey, friends, I want to open us in prayer. And uh, then I want to encourage you to open to Matthew chapter 14. But let us, uh, let us pray. Lord, each of us are coming hurried minds, hurried hearts. We pray that you would settle us down and make us available. Lord, help us to maybe toss and crinkle up the, the ideas and the, the list of things we want to get to later on today. To just crinkle it up like a piece of paper and throw it aside and just be available and focused on what you'd have for us in this time in your word and in this storyline concept today that I think is so transformational. So, Lord, would you, by your Holy Spirit's power, lead us uh, in the coming minutes that you would teach us and form us. And we pray this in your name and everyone said, amen, amen. Well, friends, uh, the emphasis for today in our series of storyline is that of moments that bring change. If you've been with us in this storyline uh, series, we've been talking a lot about what does it mean to know your story, okay? To know your life story, the ups and the downs, all the aspects of your life story, and to see how God has been at work in your story so that you can recognize it when moments come into the future. And just like any good story, any good book, or any good movie captures our attention, uh, uh, so does a, a good story that understands the notion of change. And I want you to think just for a moment, if you will, what was your favorite childhood TV show? Okay. What was your favorite TV show as a child? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who just said that? Oh, brother, you're so awesome. Because... I actually want to share about Gilligan's Island. And uh, he's not a plant, by the way. He's just really smart. Uh, There is a moment of change within that story that captured my imagination as a kid. And of course, if you don't know what Gilligan's Island is, uh, it's a story about an eccentric group of people who actually have this common event. It's that they got on a ship and they were shipwrecked and it tossed them into all sorts of of change. In fact, uh, if you're over the age of 30, you'll know this tune. If you're not, this is a history lesson. Okay. We're exposing our leg. Go ahead, Reed. Yeah. You'll know it. Come on. Sing with me. Just, Just sit right back and you'll hear it. Come on, everybody. Tale, tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day on a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. Nice and loud. Come on, everybody. Storm's coming. The weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. Okay, everybody under the age of 30 just like, ah, right? They don't even know what that is, right? Oh, this is the show that captured my imagination as a kid. All centered around a shipwreck. A moment of incredible change. And uh, for those of you who do know that show, know that tune... Uh, Gilligan's Island turned 50 years old this last week. Half a century, right? I had a crush on Ginger when I was a little kid. I just thought she was so cute. Yeah, she just turned 80. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me feel old. I'm sure she's still beautiful. But, but uh, well, just this timeless story of an eccentric group of people brought together by an event. A change in their life circumstances. Certainly a change in their relationships, but a pretty dramatic moment. We're going to talk about change today, moments of change. I've entitled this sermon, Waves of Change. 
bring it home to us. Have you ever been in a place where waves of change have just taken you into uncharted waters? You ever had a storm blow into your life through a diagnosis or a job change, a broken relationship that knocked you off your feet? Ever had uh, just change that brought new opportunities that were scary or mysterious? Change is one of those things that's a universal for all of us, every human being. Life is about change. In fact, the ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus uh, said, life is like a river. It's in continual state of change. You can stick your foot into the river and then you take it out of the river. And some of you know the rest of this, right? And when you put it back into the river, it will be a different river because the river has moved on. Life is a continual state of change. I think if uh, Heraclitus were alive today, he might say life is like shifting winds, continually producing new waves of change in our lives. And the reality is, is we fear change because it means that something mysterious is beyond that we can't control. And we have a lot of fears in life. I was reading about this uh, this past week, that the kinds of phobias that, that people hold. Do you know what the number one phobia is? It's uh, speaking in public. It's number one phobia. Number two is death. Okay. Number three is death while speaking in public. Right. <laughs> and I've done that a few times, but I think, uh, you know, one of the, the top phobias and fears in this life, if we were to do expanded research on this, is anything related to change, the fear of change. And if we're really honest, the waves of change, when the winds are shifting in our lives and it's coming at us in such a way that we can't control, it produces anxiety. And it demands of us a a response by faith. This is where I want to enter into our text today, Matthew 14. It brings us to an incident, not a whole lot unlike Gilligan's Island, involving another storm and another group of people on a boat. But um, I know that you probably have heard this story before. In fact, it's so, so often used in our secular culture that people will use the phrase, yeah, oh yeah, she walks on water or he walks on water. They don't even realize that they're actually referring to a story about Jesus. But this is a story many of us are familiar with. And I'm actually going to be taking a kind of an expanded view of the entire narrative and disappoint all of us if you think this is a sermon about Peter and faith. Uh, but it's that there's a bigger thing happening, Okay. And I, uh, I believe that we kind of are robbed of some of the meaning and powerful narrative happening in the, in the Gospel of Matthew if we focus too closely to one incident because it's a part of the whole, okay? And I want to help you see why. So you're going to have to pay attention as we read this because we're going to come back to a few key moments. But, but the first thing is right off the gate, the very first words starting in verse 13. Don't miss these, okay? Matthew starts this by saying, When Jesus heard what had happened... That's your, if you have your Bible in front of you, underline that phrase, when Jesus heard what had happened. Okay? Now, everything else is a response to this. So, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. He said, We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, 
take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think the best way to enter into this text and the narrative that's occurring here, describing Jesus' ministry and Jesus' life, is actually to become a character yourself. And just imagine yourself being a part of this story. I want you just to take a moment, if you will, and just recall a time in your life where you experienced sadness. Okay? Take a moment. Just think in your head. What's the first thing that comes to mind? A time where you were really sad. Maybe a storm had come into your life. Maybe a, you lost a spouse, a loved one. Maybe you didn't get the job that you'd set your heart on. Or after you had to move out of the house that you loved, those feelings of sadness. Think about that for a moment. I think it probably is true for every single one of us when we reflect on times of sadness. That as human beings, what we wanted most when we experienced the bad news, the hard diagnosis, whatever it may be, you wanted to be alone. You didn't want to be around crowds. You wanted to be by yourself, alone. Maybe you're in a distant town and you get bad news and you go to a church, but you find out that, guess what, there's a wedding happening. Or you wanted to go be with God alone in nature. You go up for a hike, but you realize there's a bunch of eager campers around you. Or perhaps you get a diagnosis and you're on your way home. Imagine that your spouse is throwing you a surprise party. What you needed and wanted most was to hide away and to be quiet, to reflect, reflect and, and pray and grieve and work through your feelings. The last thing you wanted was to be around people. When I think about that question for me, um, the thing that drew back to this was actually something that me and my sister experienced. It was the bre- death of my uh, older brother by six years, Doug, in 2001. Uh, some of you know it. We had a sibling who died of a, of a heart-related issue uh, over many years, but, but we got to be with him while he was dying. And, and, uh, and he, he died uh, in early July of 2001, and he, uh, we were able to be with him as a family. It was a gift, but uh, I had to come back home and lead a junior high camp only to go back after camp to be a part of the memorial service. Do you remember this, Sarah? Yeah. And uh, so... To go from being by your brother's side as he's dying and his family to a uh, junior high camp of about 130 kids, okay? I'm, I'm speaking, I'm leading a, a cabin, but in my heart of hearts, I did not want to be there. I wanted to be with my family, I wanted to be with Jenny, and I wanted to be alone. And one of the hardest realities of that whole time for my own grief was the fact that I was thrust into this situation where I couldn't be alone, but there were all these young people who just wanted to be around me. And wanted something from me in some ways. It was hard. Jesus' reaction here in this setting with the people that gathered around him, uh, right at verse 13, is quite amazing. It shows immense emotional strength and fortitude. And why is that, you may ask? I want you to look at verse 13, these opening words. When Jesus heard what had happened. Okay. That's, a, that's like a cue saying everything that's going to happen from here on out is actually a response to the previous narrative section that Matthew's put before us. Just prior to this passage, if you look in your own Bibles, you'll see that John had just lost his cousin, his cousin John, who was uh, killed, murdered, but in such a way that was not only evil and cruel, but dishonoring. He was 
beheaded. Now, any other uh, time you may have heard that word, maybe years ago, you wouldn't have had images come to mind. But these days in our time, we know the awfulness of beheadings, right? This ISIS phenomenon, but also what's been happening around our world around not only murdering someone and killing them, but dishonoring and disembodying them in such a way that it is awful to, to reconcile. It's inhuman. And here's Jesus just hearing the news that his cousin, the one who baptized him, the one who was the first to recognize Jesus, even when, before he was born, John recognized Jesus was Jesus. This is how close their relationship was. And John was killed in a way that must have been a foreshadowing, a warning to Jesus of what lay ahead for him too. Can you imagine what's going on in the heart of Jesus? The mixture of grief at the news of John's death mixed with his own dread at the fate awaiting him. Is there any wonder that he wanted to go and be what? Alone. To go spend time in prayer and just to deal with his own grief. And yet when he draws away to be quiet, the crowds follow him and they clamor to be around him and they want something from him. And his reaction isn't anger or frustration or impatience like we would you know, offer in that situation. But rather, it's compassion. He renders his sorrow over John and perhaps his sorrow over himself into sorrow for them. Into sorrow for them. Friends, I want you to catch this. Before the outward and visible power of Jesus being given in the works of healings, walking on water, healing the sick, Before those outward and visible works of power come the inward works of power. The inside his heart, he had to do the inward, invisible work of power in which Jesus transformed his own feelings into love for those in need. He does this with the disciples in the boat as they shook with fear. And the winds of change surrounded them. Do you remember his first words to him, in fact? Take courage, it is I, reaffirming, it is me, Jesus. Don't be afraid. And even more so, he shows love to Peter as Peter gets out of the boat. And Peter gets a hard time, but gosh, he walked on water for a little while, right? That takes some courage. Even though Peter doubted when he saw the winds and didn't keep his eyes on Jesus, he showed incredible faith. It seems to me that there are several different reactions to to, uh, the winds of change here in this story. For Jesus, before the outward works of power come the inward work of power in which Jesus transforms his own feelings into love for those in need. On the other hand, we see the disciples reacting with doubt and faithlessness. We see the overwhelming need presented by the crowds or the power of the waves, and they couldn't handle it. They couldn't live in faith. And so it is with us, friends, that in the middle of the nastiest storms, the biggest moments of change in life, and storms can be so nasty, It is so necessary and wise to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on God, to focus on the face of Jesus, on the strength and power of God rather than the storms. And I've heard it told so many times in our church of people who said, I could not have gotten through it. I could not have gotten through the storm or the cancer or the loss of my dad or the loss of my child if it weren't for me keeping my eyes on Jesus or for the church that helped me stay uh, committed and faithful and keeping my eyes on Jesus during that time. Keep your eyes on Jesus. One of the things that I love about Storyline is that it's a way of looking at our life story and recognizing not only the high points, but the moments of change, the valleys, the storms that have changed the course of our lives. And in recognizing that the highs, the highs and lows and what was happening in those highs and lows, we start to recognize God's redemptive work in our story. And for some of us, it involves a counselor, a therapist, uh, which is always wise, always encouraged. For some of us, it's, it's by working it through with a pastor or some spiritually wise friends that can help you understand a bit of your story. But when you understand your own story, your unique story, you start to see and notice the redemptive patterns of God in your life. And you see it with fresh eyes of faith and you're fueled by it. The waves and the hits 
can come, but when your eyes are on Jesus, you got gas in the tank all day long. I want to just share with you how this works, or I think a, a good image of this. One of my favorite stories is told by a, a Hall of Fame football player by the name of Mike Singletary. Anybody know Mike Singletary? Yeah. Middle linebacker for the Chicago Bears in the 80s, okay? And, uh, and he was uh, an incredible football player, a vicious, violent football player, too, as a, as a defensive player, and, and uh, was not a, a man who was easily intimidated. But he tells the story of one of the most intimidating, competitive experiences of his entire career. And it happened in 1984 when they were playing the Los Angeles Rams. If anybody knows the Los Angeles Rams back then, they're, uh, they're all-world, all-pro running back was a man by the name of Eric Dickerson. Okay? This dude was just a hoss. I mean, uh, Eric Dickerson was an amazing running back. And, uh, and Singletary prepared for the game. He knew exactly what their favorite play was. It was called the toss sweep, which is where the quarterback hikes the ball and sweeps it to the, or throws it, tosses it to the running back. And then the running back heads towards the sideline, tries to find a hole that they can zing up. Well, he knows it's coming. First play out of the gate, Mike Singletary, uh, oh, he's bulging, right? I mean, if you remember the pictures of eyes bulging, he's waiting for the play, and he sees it, it's a toss sweep, and he feathers it perfectly as a linebacker, and then he just launches through the hole that he sees, expecting Dickerson to be on the other side, and Dickerson is there, and bam, violent collision. Dickerson gets blown up uh, on his back, and, and as Mike Singletary tells the story, he says, he's thinking when he's crawling over Dickerson that he's going to see snot bubbles and you know, water out of his eyes, and, and, that, and that he's going to be crying, maybe, you know. That, uh, that Dickerson will just be done. Like the, the hit was so violent and so powerful that there's no way he'll ever be able to come back and play the rest of the game. And so he's crawling over Dickerson and he sees him and he sees the snot bubbles coming out of the nose. He sees the water coming out of his eyes. But, but then he sees that Dickerson is smiling. He's smiling. And then as only Mike Singletary can say, he, he says... Uh, he shares the story that these words came out of Dickerson's mouth that were the most competitive and intimidating words he'd ever heard from an opponent. Dickerson said, I've got gas in my tank all day long. <laughs> and Singletary hit him as hard as he could, and Dickerson took it. In fact, Dickerson took it all the way to the bank. 150 rushing yards, two touchdowns. They ended up blowing away the, the Bears that year. I got gas in my tank all day long. Friends, the waves and the hits can come, but when your eyes are on Jesus, he gives you power. He gives you strength. You've got gas in your tank all day long. The prophet Isaiah says these words to us that are essentially a similar type of encouragement to a people of Israel who are suffering great loss and change in their own lives. He says, do not fear about the change. I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Someone shared with me a while back that the storyline concept that we've been in was so new and empowering and refreshing. They thought, why have I never heard this before? This idea of looking at my own story as the roadmap for how God would use me into the future. And I shared with her actually that it's, it's actually not new at all. This is, a, this is a Jesuit practice the church has encouraged for centuries. This is the practice of examine. Some of you have ever heard the word examine? That's the, the prayers of examine. We actually do this around the Stuart household table. If you ever come to dinner at our house, you'll participate. But we ask our kids, our four kids, we have, um, we have a little football team of our own, uh, 10, 8, 6, and 3 and a half. And we just ask them the question, what was the high of your day and what was the low? Okay. And... Uh, and what our kids have learned is to share what were the moments of disappointment that day, of sadness, something happened that wasn't fair, wasn't right. And then also, what were the moments that were high moments, celebrations, worthy of celebration? So we share around the table. And friends, what we're t- teaching our kids is to see the power of sharing our highs and lows together. And to be reflecting on those highs and lows over the course of your day. One of the things I love about our church, if you'll look in our bulletin, is that one of our values is we're in it together. 
Highs and lows, peaks and valleys, we are in community and in relationship together. We celebrate those things worthy of celebration. We mourn and grieve with those things that need to be mourned and grieved, but we do it together. So that's something that we've kind of learned in our family that is directly out of this sense of examine. Friends like Jesus himself, before we can experience, often before we can experience the outward and visible work of God in our lives, we must let Jesus transform the pain and the loss in our stories and he'll transform them to opportunity. And when that happens, we can love others who are in pain. In fact, you'll often be led to people who are going through similar losses and change to whom you can minister. This is crazy, but it's beautiful. One of my favorite things about my parents is that in the wake of losing uh, their son, my brother Doug, God started to heal some things in them, and then he started to bring people who'd lost children too. How is it that over the course of their pain and loss, being transformed by Jesus, that they could now be used and minister to others? This is the transforming work of God in our lives, friends. No longer victims to the winds of change, but victors in Jesus' name. There's a prayer in my uh, office, a prayer of thanksgiving. I keep it on a little post-it note, and it says these words. Maybe this would be a gift to you. I thank God for protecting me from what I thought I wanted and blessing me with what I didn't know I needed. Remember that prayer in junior high? Oh, Lord, would you make her fall in love with me, please? (laughs) I'm so glad I didn't marry my junior high sweetheart. But you think about broken relationships or the job you didn't get. The moments of disappointment or the the change where you had to move from one city to another and how God was at work through all of that, the highs and the lows, to lead you to where you're at now. And I am so thankful, personally, for the winds of change and loss, the hits that maybe put me on my back, but it led to greater things. And I want to just close with this. I think when we do the hard work of reflecting on our personal story, When we recognize God's hand in our lives, I believe that's what draws us to worship him. That's that's the basis of gratitude and worship. Because when it was all said and done, these series of miracles convinced the disciples in the early church that Jesus was the son of God. This is the point Matthew's getting to, okay? Don't miss the exclamation point at the end of the passage. The result of the miracles was not just in and of themselves to bless individuals. It was because it was revealing the very nature and heart of God. And the people, they saw these, you know, raising of Jairus' daughter. They saw the healing of the lepers, the casting out of demons, the walking on water, the feeding of five thousands. And the ultimate outcome of that was not that we're so great that God would bless us. The outcome was this is the Son of God. Jesus Christ. Truly, this is the Son of God. That it was in Jesus that they found their hope and new life and they worshiped Christ as Lord. Friends, when we re-understand our, and, and consider and reflect on our story, we start to realize that God is asking us to get out of the boat, to no longer be victims. He's saying, you know what? I blessed you. You feed them. Don't expect someone else to do it. It's actually going to be in the work of feeding, in the work of faith as you step out of the boat that God is going to shape you for the things to come because he wants to use you. He wants you to be his tool for mission to love and bless in this world, which is why I think Jesus was able to do that quick transformational churn from his own pain to compassion for others. No long, he didn't see himself as victim, but he saw himself as victor who was able to bless and serve. Friends, so often I see in uh, the life of Christians an inability to turn the corner from their own navel-gazing about pain, and they need transformation by God's power, but they can't do it. And so they're no good to those who have pain later on. What would it mean for you to understand your story in such a way that God could take your pain, could take the occurrences of change and loss and and discomfort and actually use that, transform that in you so that you can bless others? Because if you know the story of the disciples, they would go on from here. Peter may have fallen in the water that day, but it wouldn't be very soon where he's leading thousands to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ when he was preaching the gospel. And the disciples themselves, 
they would go on to do great works. Even, Jesus says, greater works than Jesus did because they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that God could use your story? Do you believe that? And through the series of events in your life, incomprehensible often to us unless we go back and examine them, do you believe that God could stop you in your tracks and bring you to the realization that truly Jesus is the Son of God and that you would worship him in that spirit? Would you do that? Let us pray. Lord, it's, it's amazing to me to think about the internal work you did just even in this setting to put your, your love and your compassion, your attention on those who were in need on that hillside or the disciples in need in the boat. Or maybe you would give us a perspective, a new fresh perspective on how we've seen those highs and lows in our life and how you long to use those and transform them so that we can be used by you in the future. Lord, help us to, uh, to really examine this, this phenomenon of becoming victims to the circumstances around us, shipwrecked without hope, to victors, ones who use every circumstance to grow and to accept what you'd have for us and to maybe lean into the ways you want to use us for your ministry. Lord, would you do that in us? And as we come to the table now, we recognize once again the great cost that this table came uh, to us in the form of grace by your broken body and your shed blood. Lord, would you renew that grace in us this morning as we eat this meal? And we pray this in your name and everyone said.